Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting me. I'm honoured to be here. It's been uh, it's, it's great to be here this afternoon, but it's been a real, uh, <coughs> really fascinating thing for me just last couple of days to, to look through and get some idea of how you organise yourselves and how things happen. And uh, I, I've got a sort of, it's not a random collection of things today, but I'll get through the slide pretty quickly and then some things will resonate and some things won't. And those that do, we can pick up on after tea, hopefully, um, in a bit of discussion, but I'm not sure how this is going to go. Um, developers are looking for this, uh, like a finished project, that's the, 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 the old goods yard at the King's Cross. Um, but, but they don't see anything other than the cost of building things. Everything else is dead money, so investigations uh, of, of any sort that, that aren't bricks and mortar uh, are, in simple terms, a waste of money. So how do we uh, compare between what I do every day and what you do every day? We dig holes, we fill them in again. <laughs> I've given up trying to explain to people, I don't know what you all do at dinner parties, you're trying to explain, so what do you do? And I've been saying that for the last 40 years. It's, it's too complicated for most people. Um, it's, it's, but the work's unpredictable duration, it's undervalued, and the clients don't understand it. And, and this sounds like I'm repeating what's been said in the last two talks. <laughs> but... <laughs> um, we use bigger trowels. <laughs> <laughs> how does our work compare? Um, oh, this is just how the industry, we are where we are today. I mean, you, I, I understand that the, the, mm, the, the, this commercial industry of archaeology, or commercial archaeology industry, so emerging from the public sector, uh, it's 25 years, right. something right. like that. Yeah. Well, I, I, in geotechnics, um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's been, a, I suppose, since the war, really, or slightly before that. It's emerged. Um, but we are where we are, and we're not happy where we are. The grass is always greener, I assure you. Um, but uh, one of the things that really dogs us in, in our industry is the amount of um, guidance and, and, and uh, standards and regulations and so forth. And uh, one of the biggest, I mean, there are probably for producers of, of, of guidance for our industry, not us, that, that's not ourselves, uh, and, and that are external. And one of them is the BSI. Uh, and you wouldn't believe the number of British standards that we have to uh, um, deal with, or somehow the European standards that have been <coughs> translated into British standards, and we still have to deal with them. And, and you sit there and I, I think, well, why on earth are we here? And we're here because we've emerged from the construction industry, um, or, or, or from uh, the engineering side of the construction industry, who love standards, they just love them. Uh, and, and I just think we wouldn't be where we are today unless we had this history behind us. And I think the same sort of applies to yourself. So some of the exercise perhaps is to get a clean sheet of paper out, think that if we were designing our industry, how would we design it? Rather, rather than saying, well, we are where we are, because we can come on to that later. But so, so I only found one, if you search BSI, I found one standard that, that it's got, comes up if you type in archaeology, unless I spelt it wrong. Uh, and I don't know. If I, I, I don't think the CIFA have actually produced a consultation response, or have they to that? I'm really impressed by the amount of consultation responses that, that the CIFA have done to documents. But uh, anyhow, that, that's that one. Um, so we emerged as a bolt-on um, <laughs> underneath the, the civil engineers and the structural engineers, and, and uh, the, most of the, the geologists or the engineering geologists was doing was interpreting the, 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 the results of tests. The engineers and, and, and the uh, construction industry love tests and numbers, basically. And if, if you're a geologist, you come in with a sort of conceptual understanding of how earth processes work and, and, and what's this and what's that. And you're, you're acting as an interpreter. You're producing numbers and figures so that somebody can plug them into a design. Um, but um, I suppose about 20 years ago, yeah, probably mm, a bit more than that now, 30 years ago, we started to emerge as, as risk assessment gave us a place on the design team, um, mostly because of the land contamination excitement, um, uh, uh, but also flood risk and unexploded ordnance. These are things that more things for clients to worry about. But but because this, these last three subjects weren't things that readily sit within the civil or the structural engineers, they said, "Oh, we don't know about that." So suddenly the client was talking directly to us. So we were able to sort of emerge from underneath the control and the bills of quantities being thrown at us by. Um, so the big consultants or what have you, and, and, or the multidisciplinary, and, and, and move out and have a direct discussion with the client and say, look, we're experts and we can, we can help you. So that, there's a thought there. <coughs> I 
I've been introduced as a, a past chairman of the ADS, which is the Association of Geotechnical and Geo-Environmental Specialists. But really, there's a lot of parallels with the CIFA. Membership, we have corporate and individual. I actually think um, that, that, that uh, we've got about, you've got about 70 corporate members, and, and we've got maybe a, less than 150 corporate members, but it's mostly those. We have very few individual members. You have 3,000 individual members, uh, and, and that's great. And one of the big things we're doing at the ADS at the moment is changing it all around. So I think you've restructured a bit because of your chartership. Is that right? Did I gather that? No, no, the the, the yeah. governance now is, is, is this um, board of directors and, and, and an advisory panel, which is a great model. And, and the AGS is in the process of producing exactly that. So at the moment, it's slightly different. But the, 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 the way it works is very democratic, or it's aiming to be that. Um, so we set standards, codes of conduct and guidance, just as you do. And we, we aim to be a voice for, for the whole lot of individual member firms to... Uh, to uh, to, to have a voice in the in uh, policy making and so forth. We're definitely not as good at, res at responding to uh, consultations as you lot. So 20% of our members employ more than 20 specialists, 50% employ <coughs> fewer, than, fewer than five. There's probably a bit of similarity there, but we probably represent in all about 5,000 um, people who work in the industry, which is probably the same for you guys. And our, there's our bit of our mission statement down there to promote and enhance the quality of professional practice, facilitate liaison between organisations, champion and represent the industry, represent and uphold members' interests, publish guidance, encourage quality management, and assist influence mating within clients. Well, there's the CIFA one by comparison. It's very similar. Inspiring excellence, that's good, right? So, it, it, it's similar words, isn't it? Um, the AGS structure, at the moment, is we have a main committee and six working groups. You've got goodness knows how many working groups, as well as area groups. We're not represented by area. Everything happens in London, basically, um, which, which is a right um, pain for those who are uh, sort of in the hinterlands. Um, but the working groups uh, are, are quite productive. And the contaminated land working group particularly has been uh, important in raising the status of the AGS. I want to come up, one of the things, I oh, sorry, just go back. Um, one of the main things in having the ADS is you then, you have a, a voice or a seat at the table of other industry forums. So suddenly that gets you out there to go and engage with other people who are influencing your industry. And one of the big things in, in, in the construction industry is, is this thing, the land forum, which um, emerged, uh, well, start about the millennium, but its present form emerged in 2011 to discuss brownfield issues, to sort out um, how, at a very high level, how things will be addressed. So it, was a, it was a good sort of policy making, um, not just a talking shop, it was, it was trying to actually get resolution of problems. And the problem in our industry, you're lucky because you're really just yourselves and a few others, I know there's some heritage um, organisations and so forth, but the Land Forum um, has to... Uh, deal with all this red tape that there is, and also the, 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 the sort of um, legal red tape, but the, the um, legislation. Um, but this, the form is to, to collect everyone together. So through that, you see, look at that, got, there's a lot of sheep to herd when you're trying to get something. But, but it's doable, uh, uh, and uh, there's local government and the expert agencies in there and so forth. Um, but no, we all sit around the table or they come on, you know, remote, um, they telephone in. Uh, and uh, one of the products of that is, is uh, pertinent. It's, it's a national quality mark system, which is being launched later this year. It's really being driven. It's, it's the reason it's going to be successful is because of the um, reduced resources in the public sector and particularly within the Environment Agency and local authorities in terms of specialists for dealing with contaminated land. I, I'm, I'm interested, and you can answer it later, but I'm interested in who deals with the scoping of um, investigations and, and what qualifications they have for producing a scope of investigations. Mm -hmm. uh, is it the regulator itself? And, and, and what's happening in here, it's been really interesting to um, say, well, who should be scoping contaminated land investigation or, or, or saying this is good enough, that's not good enough, and how do you recognise that competence? And if you go, I think the National Policy Planning Policy Framework is being mentioned, if, if, you, if you look in, in there, the word competence is, or, or requirement of competence only comes up in our profession 
you always seem to be competent, I think. Um, but but that, that, that there was a requirement for competent people to be involved in investigation. Well, that's the government not really helping, because <laughs> what, what does competent mean? So we have agreed through the Land Forum uh, a system for defining who is suitably competent. Now, that's great in terms of hitting the bottom line with who should be allowed to do things. Oh, yep, yeah, so another one. I'm just gonna, I can't come up here today without talking about asbestos. Um, so just a couple of things. Uh, why is it the interest? Uh, I'm sure you all are well aware. Um, there's basically three types of asbestos. There's three flavors. There's crucidolite, amosite, and uh, chrysocar. Um, the, the, the one to look at, this, this is when we stopped using crucidolite, importing it. This is when we stopped importing amosite. And uh, yes, uh, when, uh, yeah, this is when we stopped bringing uh, chrysocar. And that's the corrugated sheeting, you know, they said. Stuff. But look at this. This is the exposure model, the blue line, and this is the uh, annual death rate. And it's not yet peaked. You can see it's, the green's actual and the reds are projected. So in uh, well, the next few years, we'll be peaking at 2,000 deaths a year due to mesothelioma. Um, it's, uh, that's, that's the reason why you should be interested in asbestos. Um, oh, why the interest? <laughs> I was going to say, the, the scary thing for me, I've been involved in the asbestos, particularly uh, the last five years, I suppose. Uh, and I've, it's a bit late for me now, um, but all my life we've just been working on these sites, left, right, and centre. Uh, and, and in the last five years, I've been on a bit of adventure. I've, I've been uh, working with the health and safety executive and their working group to the Committee on Carcinogens, developing new, new um, guidance for for um, for people uh, working with asbestos or. or, or not when you say working with asbestos, not you know the, all all this licensable stuff is all about removing asbestos and like asbestos contractors. But in my industry, it's like oh, we're not insured for asbestos, so don't mention it. And it's like <laughs> we never thought about it. And I think well, hang on, we we really need and as a trade organisation, the AGS needs to be doing something for its members. Um, so uh, we started to look at things and, and you know we test laboratory samples for contaminants and so forth uh, and. Asbestos screening was just something you could bolt on if you wanted it. And, and a terrifying thing happened when they discovered that I think more than half the samples of made ground that weren't being scheduled for asbestos testing, when they were tested for it, they found asbestos to be present. So it's just like what we were missing was huge. Uh, and so that gave rise to us doing uh, something within the AGS. Well, there's CAR 2012 you need to know about. We missed that one. And, and uh, we produced this which is guidance for our members as to how to go about complying with CAR in a very simple way, or hopefully a very simple way. How do you carry out an asbestos risk assessment when you, haven't, you don't know much about the site? And it's not about the site history quite often. It's not that. that we, we find it on greenfield sites where some enterprising contractor brings in a whole road made of recycled aggregates. You know, basically, anywhere you see bricks, demolition rubble. I mean, I'm not talking about 19th century um, demolition rubble, but, but 20th century demolition rubble. You've got asbestos, 10 to 1. Um, so just be aware of that. Uh, and uh, sorry, the good news is it's really easy to manage. <laughs> it's really easy to manage. To, to get up to, to an uh, exposure limit that's going to cause a problem is, um, it may not be quantifiable, but it's easily preventable um, by simple precautions of damping down dusty sites in the summer, wear your mask. So here again, the AGS, we came on, hopefully the AGS is on there. Yes, good. Um, we're sitting at the table with these people and we're trying to sort out what we should do about asbestos. And so there's some guidance coming out from the Joint Industry Working Group, which takes on board disparate things like the waste regulations and, 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 and some ridiculous um, classification for materials containing asbestos and, and some equally ridiculous things from, from um, uh, vehicle licensing um, regarding the, the carriage of dangerous goods and so forth. The, 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 there's no joint together thinking about asbestos. And this Joint Industry Working Group has been really good at getting these people around and saying, look, we need to, to sing one tune that isn't confusing because there's total confusion out there at the moment. So, um, now change. I want to talk about change in the industry. I mentioned that, that we should get a clear uh, piece of paper out. How are we doing? Good. Um, new technology. Can we give up? The telephone took 75 years. This is the, the amount of time it took to get to 50 million users. So the telephones took 75 years, the radio took 38 years, and you worked out, and, and apparently this thing called Angry Birds, which I know nothing about, took five weeks. So 
things are happening really, really quickly, and I'm sure you've got new technology happening within your industry, like drones, I suppose, are one of the things that have probably been discussed in the last few days. But, but the, 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 there's a huge amount of, of, of acceleration happening. And to think that um, the whole way the whole industry is structured is going to stay the same as it did in the last 25 years is frankly fatuous. Um, and you can see it beginning to happen. Um, do you know a firm called Amazon? You know, you can see what they've done to certain industries, and, and people are saying it's only a matter of time before they turn to the construction industry. Um, that picture was of China. Um, so is that one. Um, yeah, so is that one. Um, th that's the weather in China yesterday. My son's out there. So th that's somewhere near Mongolia, I believe. I can't pronounce the place, but he's, um, you know, that's yesterday. No, there you go. <laughs> I'll get tomorrow's tomorrow. The, the, the infrastructure in China is amazing. Now, I'm not saying it's 100% safe, and, and, but maybe, think back to Brunel and, and British engineering excellence, maybe he wasn't 100% safe. Maybe we shouldn't be as precautionary in terms of our codification in, the, in our particular business as, as we are, but somewhere between here and, and engineering excellence. I mean, China started looking at um, high-speed rail which is going to be important for you guys, started looking at it at the same time as we started looking at it. They've built, oh, don't quote me, it might be 93,000 kilometers or something, a huge amount. And it's up and running, it's open. It's there, my son was on it last week. And, and we, we're about to drill 9,500 boreholes. <laughs> and, and God knows how much, in terms of archaeological trenches, to, to, to think about doing it. Yeah. British engineering excellence is, is, is in jeopardy. The, 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 the ex, they haven't got their infrastructure sorted out. They're now moving or exporting it. The first mass transit railway in Africa, I understand, was opened in September last year, built by the Chinese, not by, by British engineering excellence. So the client is going to be confused. <sighs> Hang on, this railway looks like that railway. They do look very similar. What's the difference? And, and it's the same sort of argument. We've got to educate our clients as to what the difference is between um, what, what we have and what uh, other people are offering. So, nearly there. I think it's all about knowledge. Um, and, and, and I go on again. Traditionally, when we're looking at our industry, and perhaps the same with yours, you look at some generic capabilities, like able to speak or stuff like that, or to write a report. And technical. So going back to the first one, I, I have to say a big thank you. Whenever I get a selection of reports to look on my desk, the first thing I look at is the archaeological one. Invariably, your reports in terms of the geological descriptions are, are, are way up there compared to the, you probably know this well enough, compared to what's produced by our industry. It, it really is. It, it's from, is the content, if they're talking about clean sheet of paper, is the content of your reports with all that stuff at the beginning and then, the, you know, this, this, it's all in there. Is that really necessary on your clean sheet of paper? Is there a better way of communicating what you need to communicate to the right people? Uh, and, and I don't know. I don't know how it's structured, but I just say that. But anyhow, traditionally, generic capability and technical knowledge. Well, the technical knowledge is what we all went to university for, and we got thrown out. Um, well, sorry, we emerged from university <laughs> with, uh, with, with uh, a great lot of, of theoretical technical knowledge. Um, and that's been said, I, I hate the charter. Then I came back to, well, there isn't really an institution, a learned institution for ourselves. So I had to get chartered as a civil engineer, I had to get chartered as a geologist, then I had to get chartered as an environmentalist, which sort of, it's a bit of a mix, mismatch, but we're some, I'm, I'm, what I do is somewhere in the middle of those three things, apart from uh, other things. <laughs> but then also, some say, well, how do you know you're qualified to do this? And so... The silk is a, is a register of, there's only about 100, maybe 200 now, of people in the country who, who are specialists in land contamination and land condition. And, and they are the people who are probably going to move on to become suitably qualified under this National Quality Mark Scheme. Um, but, so there's a silk organisation, then, then that's too much emphasis on that. Uh, ROGEP is a register of geotechnical or ground engineering professionals. So now you've got a ROGEP register you need to be a member of if you're going to be able to talk about basements in Camden or something. And, 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 then we have qualified persons who can talk about waste, uh, and then we have this SQP, this suitably qualified person who's coming in for, for contamination. And it's confusing. And someone says to you, well, I, I you know, there might be a, someone in the planning department saying, saying who, we need an expert. 
who should we turn to? Can I get a qualified civil engineer? And he said, well, no, he might not know anything about what we're talking about. Or, 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 or can I get a, one of these road jets? Well, he might, know, he might know nothing about this aspect of it. So unfortunately, because there isn't an institution for my profession that's specific to it, um, you, you, you've got Venn diagrams and intersections and so forth. So it's very difficult to actually pin it down. That's my excuse for having so many initials. Um, this is more interesting. So the traditional thing was technical, uh, so generic <coughs> capabilities and technical capabilities. I actually think, because of what I sort of said about knowledge, that, that anything can be produced, um, or more or less anything can be found out fairly quickly. Uh, and so the knowledge isn't as important now as these capabilities. And right at the top there, I think I put it at the top actually because of the day, is understanding your clients, understanding your clients' needs. And that's not just like one type of need, but understanding everyone within, like the QS, he wants something measurable. And he's not going to be happy unless he has something measurable. Um, but be very wary of what you give him. <laughs> but nevertheless, keep him happy. Keep everyone happy and, and make your clients look brilliant and all this, you know. So if you can actually get into their shoes and see what drives them. Um, I, I'm sorry, the next thing, communication. Uh, again, that didn't hit me till way on in my career. Uh, presentation. Then these sort of clever things like facilitating, getting things to happen the way you want, or getting the right people together to make things happen. Then planning, time management, you know, that. But problem solving, like being able to, to get a clean piece of paper out and work out the problem from first principles. Um, this is what I'm looking for in, in, in people who are, for the future who are coming to work for us. Commercial acumen, it's not a dirty word. And I, I think it's appalling that, that, that you have projects where you might make a loss. That, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have any. Um, you shouldn't have anything like that. Uh, this, this next one's probably the most important, hence it's involved, articulating value. And trust me, we're no good at it either. But, but that's what we all need to concentrate on. What are we actually doing? And, and, and once we've worked out how much money we're saving someone and, and we've communicated to that to them properly then surely they're going to want us to work for them it should be easy so the technical knowledge actually is right at the bottom there are all these other skills you need and you need to be clever and, and, and intelligent and so forth but really the technical knowledge it doesn't much matter what your specialist subject is because it was certainly in the contaminated land world you, you've got to be keeping yourself up to date your CPD and so forth it's, it's changing by the week um, the, the things you need to be uh, on the ball with. So, how does it fit into the scheme of things? That, 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 how, how, what, 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 how does it fit in? Is it into the traditional construction um, framework and, and into this perhaps a new world we're, we're moving towards whereby all the design, all, all the thinking is done up front and, and you've got buildings being built off site, maybe in another country, or being built by robots. Or, 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 you know, the, the actual thing happening very differently to the way it does today. H how do you see the future? And then, fundamentally, why does the client need your services? What's his driver? And, and the second part of that, how, why should he choose you? It's, it's, I'm sure it's not about the tendering. It's, you have to move away from that. And I've seen, in our, um, our side of things, having to do that. People should use us because well, for lots of reasons, but the, the, the bottom line price will always be someone cheaper. So this is what my company thinks we we're offering, is comfort, liabilities. Most clients don't know what they're buying, so that might not be construction actually, but nonetheless, we, we might get involved in saying it's all right. So with some sort of insurance against the total project cost, they might not know the way, what, what do I have to do to, to build this thing, you know? And, and if you have a knowledge of, the, we talked about the planning laws or the various hoops you need to go through, if you can sit down and explain that to them, then that's great. Um, project cost savings and the certainty over those, or reducing the, 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 the uncertainty perhaps, and time. And certainty of regular compliance, that's got to be important for you guys. It's quite often that the end goal, and I've blatantly done it in the past, it's put in a, a, a nice big fat profit at the end of the job on discharge of planning conditions, which a client can relate to, because that's all he had in his sight from the outset. You're really here, you're doing everything you're doing, just so that I can get this piece. Of, I'm not really interested in archaeology. I'm, I'm just <laughs> want this. And, and why not recognize it if that's the case? Thank you. Thank you.